Hi, I'm Max Kaiser, and this is the Kaiser Report. Oh boy, it's already 2011. Time to look back and look forward, and time to bring in Stacy Herbert. Stacy. Max Kaiser, I thought you were going to mention that 2011, we already see silver spiking. It didn't take long for silver to bust out of the gate. What else? What else? Well, we have the 2010 asset performance numbers. Mm. They are in. Number one is palladium, number two, cotton, but number three performer of last year, silver up 83.5%. Yeah, I remember the palladium club back in New York City in the 80s, did some serious dancing. <laughs> well, Max, gold was only up 29.5%, just up that laggard, much. Laggard, laggard, laggard. But with the silver and gold up these much, of course, we've been talking about these as currencies, and it takes me to the next headline. Georgia GOP -er pushes bill for taxes to be paid in gold and silver. This is from talkingpointsmemo.com, and it's a relatively uh, progressive left-wing website in the U.S., if, if you can call anybody there left-wing. And they're talking about Georgia State Representative Bobby Franklin, Republican, has sponsored legislation to force the state to conduct all monetary transactions with U.S. gold or silver coins. Yes, well, the fact is that... The U.S. has never been off the gold standard in one way or another. It's hard-coded in the Constitution. And now they're just slowly recognizing this eventuality that they must return to hard money to prevent the slide into the fiat money abyss. Well, the most interesting thing about this article is the comments. This is an excellent idea. However, why stop at gold? I suggest that the proposed legislation be expanded to include polished stones, beads, blankets, and trinkets. Eureka! More ignorant GOP politicians or the dupes who vote against their own interests. And then finally, GOP and their nutty, unhinged ways. Well, yeah, it's amazing that the so-called left, so-called progressives in America have bought hook, line, and sinker this idea that a Federal Reserve note that has no collateral value whatsoever, that's exchangeable into nothing, is somehow of value in an economy like the U.S. At the same time, of course, they're talking about raising the debt ceiling in the U.S. to 14, 15, 16, 20 trillion dollars. Why do they have to keep raising the debt level? Because they keep flooding the, the, the economy with these worthless, bogus fiat U.S. dollars. Silver is up 83.5 percent last year. Gold is up 29.5 percent. The dollar is up 1%. I remember the dollar is allegedly a safe haven in these uh, you know, tumultuous times. And here are these people holding on to the dollar for dear life and, and laughing at anybody who would dare buy silver or gold. That just shows you that you're nowhere near uh, a bubble. Good old Kentucky bourbon. That's a good currency to use in times of harshness. Yes, bourbon and bullets. Go back to the pioneering days in America. Bourbon bullets and pork bellies. Pork bellies did a lot better than the U.S. dollar as well. But speaking of nutty and unhinged Max Kaiser, Obama aid throws down gauntlet in debt showdown with GOP. Hitting debt ceiling would be first U.S. default caused purely by insanity. So this is Austin Goolsby, the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, speaking to ABC's Jake T Tapper. And he's um, talking about the debt ceiling, which now stands at 14.294 trillion and we're the national debt is now only 423 billion away from it you know the democrats want to raise it to 15.5 trillion and to put that into context look at this chart this is the gdp of the usa in 2009 that's 14.119 trillion they want to raise the debt ceiling to 15.5 trillion and i think the key phrase here is insanity. <laughs> yeah. To raise the debt ceiling is a tacit admission of default. In other words, the U.S. has bonds. They can't pay off the bonds to people like China. So instead, they're simply going to move the goalposts. They're going to lower the bar. They're going to raise the debt ceiling, which is a de facto default, which I think is a good way to look at it. And I think the world has got to realize that at some point, probably this year, in 2011, the U.S. will definitely lose its AAA rating on its U.S. government bonds and probably default. 
Well, you mentioned um, the AAA rating, and that's in the headline. Today on TV, we saw the one huge reason the U.S. should lose its AAA rating. Now, this is paper bug Joe Wiesenthal from Business Insider, and he's pointing out that Lindsey Graham spoke on Meet the Press, and he was um, basically playing chicken with Austin Goolsbee the, on the president's Council of Economic Advisors. Barack Obama wants to raise the debt ceiling. Lindsey Graham, the senator, the Republican senator in uh, the U.S. Senate, doesn't want to raise the debt ceiling unless we cut Social Security payments. And, and they, they believe that they have the power to maintain that AAA rating simply by jaw jawboning the market, simply by stating on television that these, these bonds are worth AAA, therefore they are AAA. They're not going to take into consideration at all that China's got something like two, two and a half trillion of these bonds and might at one point this year decide to dump them as they move into precious metals aggressively to disconnect this relationship with the U.S. while we now know China has got that pipeline that they just opened going right with Russia. So they don't need the petrodollar anymore. Well, going back to this article, it's Joe Wiesenthal. He's a paper bug. He's arguing that why is, hasn't Moody's downgraded the U.S. when these two insane people, these two insane parties are just like playing chicken over the debt. But that takes us back to the precious metals because, of course, you don't have to rely on crazy, insane people and politics to decide whether or not the, the value of your currency is worth something. Moody's is corrupt. We know that Moody's is corrupt. There's that Moody's is corrupt. All the rating agencies are corrupt. The fund managers are corrupt. Wall Street's corrupt. Barack Obama's corrupt. Goldman's corrupt. They're all corrupt. It's all part of a corrupt syndicate. I mean, to say that suggests that Moody's is somehow acting in the good faith is, is ludicrous. But they also work hand in hand with the U.S. government and the oligarchs. So let's go on to the next headline along these same lines. WikiLeaks, U.S. diplomats acted as Boeing salespeople. Buried in the WikiLeaks documents, they're not really buried. They're just not exposed to the U.S. Um, audience because they don't need to know this kind of stuff. But apparently WikiLeaks cables describe letters from presidents, state visits as bargaining chips, and a number of leaders making big purchases based at least in part on how much the companies will dress up private planes. Yeah, they're like used car salesmen. They go around the world, uh, Hillary Clinton being the top used car salesman of them all, used jet salesman, you know, going around the world saying, hey buddy, you know, buy some jets and we'll get you some FaceTime with Barack Obama. Hey, buy some Boeing jets and uh, we'll splash out on an embassy in your hometown and give you some kickback money. It's totally corrupt. This is the American empire. It's not an empire based on guns and tanks and invasions and grabbing property. It's an, it's an empire based on flooding the globe with these diplomatic salespeople spreading the uh, U.S. corporations and their tentacles into various corners of the U.S. world for that massive global income coming their way. Yes, but we've also been covering this fact that the left wing hates the right wing and the Republicans versus the Democrats and the red states versus blue states and everybody's going to be better in some way. But these documents reveal that on both sides of the equation, none of the politicians believe in capitalism. They, they don't believe in free markets. They only believe in rigged markets for their oligarchs. Going around the world, who's the competition to Boeing? They're not allowing it because they're going in, they're strong arming these people. And the documents also suggest that demands for bribes or at least payment to suspicious intermediaries who offer to serve as agents still take place. Boeing says it is committed to avoiding any such corrupt practices. No, they're totally corrupt, Boeing. But their, their competition, of course, is Airbus. And Airbus is a consortium of European countries. And of course, uh, the U.S. is constantly pointing the finger at Airbus and saying, oh, the, Europe has an industrial policy that they're subsidizing uh, Airbus and that that's unfair competition. Meanwhile, they've got the U.S. with the world reserve currency and 400, uh, you know, um, embassies and um, what do you call them there? Uh, military bases. Yeah. With well, those things spread out all over the world, using that leverage to sell the Boeing plane. And by the way, if you look at the exports in the U.S. that they will look at and say, well, America does export stuff. It's not just donuts and guns. They always point to Boeing planes. Well, if you took away all of the salesmanship going on by the diplomats that are being underwritten by all these countries who are supporting the flying around of these diplomats to put them in these five-star hotels to get them in a position to sell all this junk to U.S. diplomatic counterparties, uh, you'd end up with Boeing stock cut in half. 
and uh, the entire export myth of America completely obliterated as it should be because the country can't export a frickin' paper bag, much less a jet, without being undermined and subsidized by the frickin' government. But speaking of corruption, here's some headlines on this in this, this collapsing empire of America. Oops, bribing Nigeria for Cheney's freedom, not legal. Well, this is according to uh, Nigeria's anti-corruption watchdog. They sent a letter to the Nigerian government saying that the $35 million that Halliburton has paid the government of Nigeria in order to uh, make the case against Dick Cheney go away, you know, he's implicated in this corruption scandal of paying huge kickbacks to the government. Well, apparently the Nigerian government responded to the anti-corruption watchdog by saying the U.S. and the U.K. governments are practicing it where you cannot successfully sustain a charge in court and you want to recover, then instead of losing the case, losing the money, then you opt for plea bargaining. <laughs> Dick Cheney. Thanks, Dick. <laughs> this is the shining light on the hill of America. <laughs> but I have a headline from this very first week of the new year as well, which, which proves that uh, Nigeria is correct in making this argument. I'm ready for it. Steve Ratner, U.S. car czar, pays $10 million over bribery claims. So this is the banker who advised the U.S. government on auto industry bailout. He's settled allegations he paid kickbacks to win state pension fund investments. <laughs> he uh, settled with Andrew Cuomo. He's paying these fines and penalties, and he's banned from appearing in any capacity before any public pension fund in New York for five years. That's a big punishment. <laughs> yeah. Well, the tragedy is simply, if you got rid of all these kleptocratic uh, boogeymen, you'd let the people in America compete on the global markets and they could do a fine job competing, but they'll never have that chance because all the roads to competition are blocked by Obama's kleptocratic coterie. Yeah, and why aren't these people sent to the private prisons? Like, let the prisons compete for these customers. Yeah. You know, these are high profile guys. They went in there into your private prison drive up competition. Darn good point. Stacey Herbert, thanks again for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Matt. All right, when I come back, I'll be going to Bangkok to speak with J.S. Kim, find out what's going on there, so stay tuned. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Time now to go to Bangkok and talk with J.S. Kim of SmartKnowledgeU.com, where you find his blog about the state of the economy and precious metals. J.S. Kim, welcome to the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max, and Happy New Year to you. Oh, thanks so much. Yes, I was just surfing over to uh, SmartKnowledgeU.com, and there are some fantastic stories on there and articles, and especially about uh, education going forward in the next few years, I think a lot of people will find very interesting. Now, uh, J.S. Kim, silver ended the 2010 up 83 and a half percent. It's rocketed in the first few days already of 2011. What's going on? What do we see in 2011? Well, I think in 2011, you'll see the progression of silver, uh, you know, rise higher again. I, I think what we have going on and, and also thanks to your campaign that went viral. So I want to congratulate congratulate you on the buy and ounce of silver and, and uh, crash JP Morgan. A, I think you're going to have some of the silver price suppression schemes end in 2011, or at least have, uh, you know, have JP Morgan run for the exits because, you know, the shorts will be getting killed. So I think, you know, right now, even at 30, 31 an ounce, silver is still highly undervalued. I don't like to make, you know, predictions because they're so hard, it's so hard to, you know, predict where silver is going to go in the next six months, the next 12 months, next two years. But I do think it will head multiple, multiples higher of where it is right now. All right, now uh, let's move over to something you wrote recently. Uh, J.S. Kim explains why the Sampoon Superstore disaster provides a good analogy for the U.S. economy. Tell us more. Okay, well, basically, um, in Seoul, there was a department store that structurally appeared to be very sound, but... You know, no one was aware of it at the time that it was structurally uh, very, very weak because what had happened was during construction, the structural width columns had been cut 25 percent. The load had been increased about four times the original uh, blueprint. And even though you had, you know, city officials that had to approve the, you know, the blueprints, they were bribed. And so, you know, they took money basically to look the other way to build, 
this crappy department building from a fundamental, you know, from a structural standpoint, and eventually collapse, killing a lot of people. So I think, you know, what we have with the uh, pretty, the pretty significant rise in U.S. stock markets for the last four months or the last quarter of 2010, it's, you know, the same thing. Structurally, there's nothing to support that. I mean, the retail investor has fled. We had, I believe now, 33 consecutive weeks of outflows from mutual funds. Um, if not for the U.S. Fed Reserve POMO uh, operations, I think, you know, the stock market would be crashing now. So on the surface, everything looks okay. And just like the Sampung department store disaster, we have, you know, the regulators that are basically, you know, taking bribes to look the other way. Okay, so structurally, the U.S. economy is weak. And you mentioned something in there, and I want to go back to it for a second, POMO, or Permanent Open Market Operations. So explain a little bit how this works. POMO operations are basically designed to recapitalize uh, U.S. banks. So what happens is the U.S. Fed Reserve, they just print money out of thin air, and they buy U.S. Treasury bonds, maturing U.S. Treasury bonds. Otherwise, the Treasury bond market would collapse as well. And therefore, the banks are recapitalized, they have money, and I assume they take a lot of that money and put it back into the stock market, because certainly the retail investor is not buying. So if the retail investor has fled the market, there's been a lot of questions asked. Who is actually buying U.S. stocks to make the stock market go up? Now, this is, uh, of course, completely anathema to the idea of free market capitalism in America, which relies on something called price discovery, which means that you've got folks in the market, buyers and sellers, interested in making transactions uh, in a way that's outside of central planning, command and control economics, uh, and, and all the government interference that is associated with other styles of economics and governing, such as, quote, socialism or, quote, communism. So how does, it, how does the American administration get away with being labeled as a communist dictatorship if they're in, in the market every day buying and selling securities at the expense of the citizens who are getting ripped off? Yeah, I mean, I think exactly you described the, the mechanism, but that's, you know, we have a lot of pundits or people that are looked at upon as experts, say, such as Alan Greenspan, right, that in the past has blamed free markets for what is going on today. So we have a lot of misinformation because certainly when central banks meddle so much with free markets and buy and sell securities, there are no free markets. So, you know, I think that the people, the public are really misled by you know, central bankers and by, you know, CEOs and executives on Wall Street. So that's why I think there's a misunderstanding of exactly how the market operates today. All right, let's talk about a, a genuine financial political dictatorship, uh, China. Uh, Albert Edwards, who is over there at Societe Generale, calls China, quote, a freak economy uh, that will collapse soon. So, uh, J.S. Kim, is this uh, similar to what you're saying in the U.S. in terms of a structural instability, or is it slightly different? Talk, walk us through how this might occur. Sure. Well, I, I also think, yeah, there's certainly bubbles in China, you know, certainly in the real estate stock market, but that's due to, you know, basically every central bank, um, I think, is involved in a, in a game of chicken, right? Because one central bank devalues their deep, their currency, their domestic currency, and the other central banks have to follow, otherwise their exports suffer. So nobody wants, you know, basically to be the first to be fiscally responsible and do the right thing because it's kind of like a domino effect. So everyone's following. So that's why I think there are massive bubbles everywhere, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in the U.S., or whether it's in, you know, the major markets in, in Asia. Okay, let's uh, expand on this uh, game of chicken analogy that you're using. So uh, otherwise known, you could call it game theory or the prisoner's dilemma or the Nash equilibrium, uh, any number of ways. In other words, you've got two players and they're careening toward each other, China and the U.S. Uh, they're both looking to um, extract uh, rent from each other. Uh, so assuming that these two collide and they collide pretty quickly, possibly this year, who is going to be the winner at the end of the day? I think it depends upon who what the true gold reserves are, right? And what, what the, I think in the, with China, they certainly are cognizant, I think, of what's going on. And um, I don't think you ever get the truth from a central banker. So, I mean, certain times, 
you know, China's official spokespeople said they'll continue to support, you know, uh, the U.S. dollar, which I don't think they're doing. I think instead they're going and buying commodities. You can see that certainly in their gold reserves. I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head, but they certainly have made a conscious effort to increase their gold reserves. I think in their sovereign wealth funds, which aren't public, they've also bought a lot of commodities and a lot of hard assets. And I think that's the way they're attempting to protect themselves. Now, on the flip side with the U.S., um, you know, since we haven't had an audit of our official gold reserves since, uh, I don't know what administration it was, but it was, you know, many, many decades ago, no one really knows if the US, U.S.'s official gold reserves are actually correct. So I think at the end of the day, it depends on, you know, who has the most precious metals and hard assets of, as far as who will survive, you know, the fiat currency game of chicken that we're seeing. Okay, well, in those terms, uh, clearly the U.S. has an advantage. Uh, if the gold that they say that they have in Fort Knox is actually there, approximately 8,000 tons, versus China's uh, supply of, I believe it's somewhere in the area of 3,000 tons. They have said that they want to increase that level by four or 5,000 tons. But I want to ask you something. You know, you're over there at smartknowledgeu.com. So let me ask you a question um, a bit theoretical. Uh, what, what if uh, China decides to play this game of chicken by announcing that they're going to monetize their gold supply and be the first country in the world to monetize their gold supply. Uh, what effect would this have? The fact that they have less gold to monetize would actually work in their favor because it would therefore equal a concurrent devaluation of their currency, if you know what I'm driving at. H have you given this any thought, J.S. Kim? Yeah, I think the first uh, country to do that uh, will win because everyone will, will want to own their currency um, and everyone will get rid of all the other fiat currencies that are basically backed by nothing or the full faith and credit of governments, which is basically nothing, right? So I think the first country that can actually, uh, you know, accomplish that goal uh, will certainly, you know, strengthen their domestic country and strengthen their economy greatly. Right, and the fact that they actually have less gold in the U.S. would work as a simultaneous devaluation of their currency, which would help their export market. So it's a double one-two punch if they were to monetize their gold. So now looking ahead to 2011, J.S. Kim, uh, what are your uh, predictions, uh, some of the two or three trends you see uh, going forward uh, for the rest of the year now? Well, the easy trends to call, I think, gold and silver will continue to rise, but I think we will have uh, because of a deepening global monetary crisis, we'll have greater bouts of volatility, both to the upside and to the downside. But I don't think that, you know, $100 moves in gold, um, not that would be common, but I, I wouldn't be surprised to see that. If gold moves up $100, silver moves up 2 or $3 a day, uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see that. Perhaps towards the latter part of 2011, maybe not so much in the beginning, but I do think that we're going to move out of the eye of the hurricane, which is basically... You know, we saw stock markets that were calm, even though we have unemployment rising in, in the United States and much of the Western world, even though inflation is, you know, about, I think last time Ben Bernanke was on 60 Minutes a couple months ago, he said inflation in the U.S. was 1.18 percent. Well, we all know it's about 8 percent or higher. So, um, you know, I think the, the trends are you're going to see more volatility even in stock markets because I've always learned over the years that, you know, as much as fraud can cause a short-term um, rise in the stock markets that there's going to be some point in time that fraud does break down, you know, that meddling in the free market. So it wouldn't even surprise me to see another flash crash, you know, happen in 2011 again. Right. And uh, getting uh, over to this inflation number that Bernanke's talking about, of course, uh, the way to get to the quote unquote real interest rates is to take the uh, current discount rate, uh, subtract the uh, CPI number, the real CPI number, and you end up with the real uh, interest rates going forward. And of course, that number currently is negative, uh, which means everyone's losing purchasing power, which means, again, people are looking to revive their fortunes in the precious metals markets. Is that uh, what, what you say as well? Yeah, yeah, I think that's totally accurate because I can't understand still how anyone in the U.S., and, and believe me, because I still talk to a lot of people in, in America that they believe that there's actually economic recovery happening. You know, they believe all the propaganda because certainly I think if these people were introspective enough to take a look at their quality of life, I think that they would see that their quality of life 
and their lifestyle is decreasing um, just because of what you said. Because certainly the increase that is certainly for corporate America, the increase in income, annual income, they, you know, the basically the cost of living adjustment they get certainly does not increase, does not equate with the devaluation of the dollar. Certainly have much more inflation. We have more taxes now. So I think that Americans all across the board, except maybe the richest top 1% of America has lost a great deal in the quality of life. All right, J.S. Kim, thanks again for being on the Kaiser Report. Okay, thanks a lot, Max. It was my pleasure. All right, and that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank my guest, J.S. Kim of SmartKnowledgeU.com. If you want to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, this is Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all. <laughs>